This is Dr. Marv Wilson in a course on the Biblical Prophets. This is session number one, Introduction. All right, I'm uh, ready to begin. Let's uh, have a word of prayer and then we'll uh, start the class. Father, we thank you for uh, bringing us back from the break. And as we uh, start our studies for this uh, spring term, we ask that you would enable us to uh, give our best effort with all the competing attractions of life around us. Pray that we will have the focus and the drive uh, to uh, work in each of our courses uh, as you've given us ability and time. Thank you for the prophets that open up for us a whole world of uh, understanding really the heartbeat of God for issues of society, and people who always held out hope. Pray that we will be people of hope as well as those who care for those around us. Guide me as I teach throughout this semester. Pray for each student. This will be a great experience of coming to know the prophets um, and change our lives by hearing what the prophets had to say. Pray this in Christ our Lord's name. Amen. All right, I'm going to start out by uh, passing out a syllabus. make just a few brief uh, comments on the syllabus. I have a uh, passion for studying scripture. Now a lot of students take courses in biblical studies and theological literature, but sadly they don't go back to the primary sources. At least they don't go back to the writings, hearing them as given by, in our case, the prophets themselves. And so that's going to be a major focus of this course. Don't palm yourself off as a psych major if you haven't struggled with Freud, Jung, Adler, whoever it is. Don't say you're a historian if you've never struggled with the Iliad and the Ad Odyssey or Herodotus or Josephus or whoever it is, as they wrote it, rather than reading secondary sources that summarize some of the emphases and themes. Now, it's always easier to grab something that predigests this material. I want you to hear it as it was written. Struggle with it. You won't understand all of it. But the good news about biblical literature is um, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. And so where so much of prophetic literature happens to be poetical, uh, when you read that, particularly in the parallelism in which you will often find it, the second uh, line, which runs parallel to the first line, uh, may be synonymous. It may expand it. It may be in contrast to it. It may explain it in some way. So in many ways, uh, even though that poetry can be difficult at times, with figures of speech, allusions to things, cryptic language. Um, the prophets are possible. They are a great undiscovered treasure of the Bible. Um, 
So that will be our emphasis. Obviously, with 15 or 16 prophets in the Bible who wrote books or whose uh, name is attached to books, uh, we're not going to be able to cover them all. But we are going to uh, focus on uh, six of the minor prophets, I think, that have very important themes for us. And also uh, end the course with uh, several weeks of emphasis on Isaiah, who is uh, one of the more important, beautiful literary works that caught the attention of Handel when he wrote The Messiah, who quotes extensively from that book. And Isaiah, of course, talks more about the Messiah than any other prophet. So he connects to the New Testament where the New Testament writers wrote there. I do have a number of, uh, in addition to the Bible, which uh, in class I'll usually be working with the NIV, though occasionally I will use the RSV. Uh, the new RSV, NIV, are two very good Bibles that can be used in studying for our two English Bible tests. So one that will focus on six of the minor prophets and one that will focus on the first uh, half of Isaiah. Um, I use it in this course also a classic work on the prophets by Abraham Joshua Heschel. If you never read Heschel, uh, Heschel is uh, a wonderful uh, source. Heschel was the first uh, Jew to come from Europe uh, to America and invited to teach in a Christian theological seminary, which he did at Union Theological Seminary across the street from Jewish Theological Seminary where he taught from 1945 to his death on December 23, 1972. Um, Heschel, unlike many books about the Bible, writes as if God is alive. <laughs> no post-mortem on God. Heschel believed God was the uh, great force within the universe whose presence was everywhere. And in light of that, one stands in radical amazement and, and awe. He wrote his doctoral dissertation on the prophets. And uh, this is a revision of that uh, German work and uh, contains some terrific material, including if you have a concept of social justice as a Christian, it's not because the early church decided, well, we ought to think about the poor and the have-nots of society. No, it's because the prophets of Israel focused on that. And the earliest church, being all Jewish, were sim simply standing in a tradition that had been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. So Heschel has some great stuff uh, on the prophets. He writes uh, somewhat poetically. For uh, as long as I have been at Gordon, I have taught a senior seminar in the writings of Abraham Heschel. And next to the Bible, he has done more to shape my view about God, Israel, the scriptures, the prophets, than any other single writer. So I think you will appreciate uh, Heschel. There are a couple other books uh, I've included. We are going to be discussing the problem of the justice of God in a mixed up world, the question of theophany, which uh, the book of Habakkuk raises for us. In poetical literature, the Bible, of course, the book of Job raises a very similar uh, question in a different context. We will uh, also be looking at Walter Kaiser's book on uh, mission in the Old Testament, Israel is an Orla Goim, a light to the nations. 
And when we look at our understanding of missions as Christians, again, the early church didn't uh, decide uh, maybe this would be a great idea to share what we've come to know with the whole world. God was already preparing the world for that, certainly with Father Abraham. Abraham, I'll make you a goy gadol. I'll make you a great nation. And uh, all the nations on earth are going to be blessed through you. Actually, Abraham was a prophet, believe it or not. And although we typically don't read Abraham as a prophet, because he's not part of the classical period of the prophets, which ran from the 8th century to uh, 5th century, approximately. But... Uh, Abram did anticipate uh, the fact that the covenantal relationship that Israel enjoyed with God was not to be something particular, it was to have a universal thrust to it. And the whole world was to come to know the God of Israel. That, by the way, is why even today as I speak, um, the Jewish community is very thankful for groups like the Wycliffe Bible Translators who have taken God's Word and put it into hundreds and hundreds of languages and dialects around the world and brought that message of ethical monotheism, the message of the prophets, Psalms, and the Torah to the world. The Jewish community couldn't do this doesn't have the manpower to do it. But the church, in a, in a sense, has come into that mission of being a light to the Gentiles, which was Israel's mission. And we, in the church, come into that as part of the expanded Abrahamic family. Um, more about that later. All right. Enough about textbooks. So, in class, uh, I will be giving some introductory lectures to the prophets, uh, and then we will begin our study of six of the minor prophets, where in class I will be talking about main themes in the prophets, making exegetical, theological, archaeological, cultural comments. Uh, on the text. In preparation for getting into the prophets, I will also be giving a couple lectures on hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is simply how to interpret the prophets. What principles uh, of interpreting this kind of literary genre sets it apart from, say, straightforward historical narrative, or law, or parables. There are many different literary genres in the Bible. And uh, there are some principles I think we need to keep in mind when we come to prophetic literature. You can look through the rest of uh, the syllabus. I've set up the readings. If you are going to keep up uh, staggering the reading so you don't try to pull an all-nighter the night before the first exam, if you follow them as I have them set up as uh, according with the times the class meets, um, that's for your own good, and that will fairly closely... Uh, tie in with where I will be in class on my lectures and will uh, keep you up uh, in your reading with the same, uh, on the same page, as they say. Your questions, yes. Yeah, you can, you can pick up 
on that material. January 24, obviously, is today. So those are the readings I would uh, try to do in the next couple days, and you will be where, where you should be. There's an introductory uh, uh, chapter on the prophets uh, from, from Heschel. Uh, Newsom is another book that gives us some of the background and some of the great uh, themes of the prophets. And I think you will find uh, Newsom also helpful. Now, while I could spend a, a whole hour talking you, to you about the abuse of the prophets, I do want to talk to you a little bit about popular views of the prophets just since I've been teaching this course, um, because all around us, you hear that word prophet, prophecy, and some very uh, distorted understandings of this word are out there today. Every time you go into uh, Walmarts or the corner bookstore, where there's a paperback rack in some store. There's always the religion section, and close to it, the astrological section. <laughs> uh, and people are always interested in this word prediction. And so, so very simplistically, average Larry Lehman has this idea, the prophets are those people who stood on street corners in white robes and predicted doom, predicted end times, um, foretold the future. That's basically what they did. And what caters to this, this kind of mindset? Well, I'll tell you, go through Shaw's. Here are some that I've collected here in the North Shore over a number of years. This is what, what people in our, our, our churches, uh, even our good friend Billy Graham, who's spoken on this campus, is put here. Armageddon is next. The mother of all wars is just weeks away, church leaders warn. Church leaders warn. Here are Billy Graham's last day prophecies. Will you and your loved ones survive? Now, I'm not going to open this up. This is just to tease you a little bit. Here, when the year 2000 was about to turn, another millennium, here's Newsweek in keeping with that. This is the fattest Newsweek I've had in many, many years, um, what the Bible says about the end of the world. But here's the word prophecy and end of the world. So once again, we are equating what is prophecy. It, it deals with, obviously, the future. Here's our old friend Arafat, who's now with his maker, whoever that is. Here's a man who's in a coma, Ariel Sharon, former Prime Minister of Israel. Bible omens warn Armageddon has already begun. Armageddon? Yeah, that's the place mentioned in Revelation 16:16, 16, 16, the final and last battle, the climactic war of history. And here you can see it's all tied in with the Middle East. So we better get our Bibles out because Middle East means Israel. Middle East Inferno Herald's final battle against forces of evil. I have another piece here. I won't throw it up here, but it talks about all these vultures presently gathering up in the Ezralon Valley, the Megiddo Valley, the Valley of Jezreel. What are they up there for? I guess to clean up all the dead bo bodies. That's 
check your local ornithologist. He'll say that's just a rumor, by the way. Bible prophecies. The government doesn't want you to know. The government doesn't want you to know. Again, I'm buying all these things in the North Shore. <laughs> the Antichrist is alive and he's living in the United States. Six signs that prove the world is coming to an end. Where the Battle of Armageddon will start and how it will end. Oh, there are all kinds of things. Here's a 2,000-year-old scroll found in Jerusalem. The Secret Prophecies of Jesus Christ. Catastrophic storms will sweep the U.S. this summer. Earthquakes will flood and punish the wicked. He will return to earth to battle Satan in 1999. A little bit later on that one. <laughs> Warning, world's top 12 Bible scholars. You guys ought to know this. World's top 12 Bible scholars all agree, all. The end of the world is near. Here are the mug shots of the 12 Bible scholars. Never heard of any of them. <laughs> but they are the world's top. <laughs> Leaders of every major religion point to signs of the coming apocalypse. Prophecy deals with the epiphania, the parousia, the apocalypse. Revelation. This is from a couple years back. Prophecy 2003-2004, and even includes in the word prophecy, Edgar Cayce, who's a psychic. See, a lot of people include Nostradamus, this guy, and a number of others in this whole genre of prophecy. Nostradamus predicts the worst storms in U.S. history. Everybody's into the predicting business. Prophet's 500-year-old warning, killer blizzards and floods will hit most of the nation in the next eight weeks. That's almost believable. <laughs> Can you take a few more? New Bible prophecies. New. Nine ways to make any man say I do. <laughs> Boy, this is a big issue. <laughs> what are these new Bible prophecies? The earth will become a huge tropical peaceful paradise, says a researcher. Now here's even a picture of Jesus, Jesus on this one. You can buy this, it's Shaw's Stop and Shop. Old and New Testament shockers, Bible prophecies coming true. Jeremiah, Isaiah, it's all there. Seven years of Bible prophecy shockers. You kids weren't born yet, but this one, 88 reasons what went wrong. I was teaching this course at Gordon in uh, early fall of 1988 when a particular person had predicted that the Lord was going to return on Rosh Hashanah 1988, which is early fall. 88 reasons why the rapture was going to be then. And uh, this guy, when it never happened, wrote this article for Christian Research Journal, 88 Reasons What Went Wrong, to complement 
this other guy who thought in 1988 that was to be the end of the world. I actually had a student in this class whose father was a very notable pastor in New York City. And uh, he called his son home because his particular church, which was networked with uh, a whole denominational connection, said, this is it, and we want you home as a family. So he withdrew from Gordon, went back to his church, and obviously after a couple weeks had passed and all of this prophetic uh, speculation, because that's what it was, proved to be a nothing in terms of a specific date that was called for, it was really so difficult for the student to come back and face his peers on this campus. It was very sad. He withdrew for the rest of the term. Now look, there have been date setters for centuries out there. People have always tried to figure things out. I grew up in my very early years of faith in a little denomination that had its start here in New England. It was called the Advent Christian denomination. It's very small, only uh, less than probably 50,000 in the denomination today. But there happened to be a farmer from Pittsfield, Massachusetts, whose name was William Miller, who said the Lord is going to return, set the date for 1843, and preached the return of Christ, the advent through all New England. And you can read about that event, you can Google it, there's a lot on the web. Everett Webers has written a book, The Search for Utopia, where he talks about what happened. They bought a large building in downtown Boston into which over 2,000 people came. They, some came equipped with large baskets hoping to soar aloft as a family unit. There's an account in Salem, Massachusetts at Gallows Hill Cemetery where a guy climbed a tree right next to the grave of his loved one, hoping to get a head start at the time of the resurrection. And actually it describes how the fire department of Salem had to go up on a ladder and coax him down from the tree because he didn't want to come. Uh, Revelers in the streets of Boston played trumpets, feigning the trumpet of the Lord. And of course, that night passed in Boston without event, the capital E event. Well, William Miller said, oh, I made a mistake because I failed to figure it according to Hebrew chronology. So we went through this again, and about a year later, 1844, he came up with another date, and of course that failed. Now what came out of this uh, date setting, and if Jesus himself doesn't even know the date of his return, as the Gospels say, how much more difficult it would seem to me for mere mortals to try to give that date but out of this movement came an emphasis on the Second Coming. There were a number of schools uh, that were established that came out of this. And William Miller had a number of different movements that split off from this emphasis of the Second Coming, including the Seventh-day Adventists, the Advent Christians, uh, and, and a number of others. Now, 
The Bible does speak of the Lord's return. But what you have to think about that is why we have the boy's name, Gregory. Because Gregory comes from a New Testament Greek word which means to be watchful, to be ready. And that is the emphasis that God has from New Testament times, I think, and to this day as we seek to be biblical in our thinking, unwarranted speculation and being dogmatic about these kinds of things is foolish. Uh, the emphasis is the New Testament seeks to speak of the fact it is imminent. That is, it could happen at any time. What could happen? What in theology, if you take systematic theology, is called eschatology. And that's eschatology. Es eschatology, I guess this thing is just shut off for some reason and won't go back on. Well, maybe that will. Eschatology comes from a Greek word eschatos, meaning final or last. And ology is usually the study of something. And so in, in Christian theology, um, events surrounding the return of Christ, which, which include uh, resurrection, uh, judgments associated with the second coming of, of Christ and his reign and rule. Some see that reign and rule as literal on this earth. And the regathering of Israel to her ancestral homeland as a harbinger, as a precursor, as in some way preparatory to the second coming of Christ. Others have differences in how that is understood. But what I, I do want to emphasize is the fact that when we hear the word prophetic literature, and in this introductory uh, class today, I want to mention that, or the word prophetic or prophecy, What is futuristic has only a very small portion of the Hebrew prophets. Their attention was far more focused upon the here and the now. Well, let me put it this way. Less than 10% of what you read in the prophets of the Bible concerned events to come. Most of what the prophets had to say dealt with the here and the now. They were the social reformers of their day. The prophets as Heschel puts it in the introductory chapter you will read, which is for the reading for today, the prophets take us to the slums and they rave as if the whole world were a slum. What to us is a misdemeanor, what to us is a miscalculation in business, to the prophets was an unmitigated disaster. The way justice, 
so easily can be perverted and become injustice. How compassion, what the prophets often couple, doing the right thing, which is linked also with compassion, having a burning desire to care for others, what the Hebrew Bible calls tzedakah. Tzedakah, or tzedakah, as it's modernized by the Jewish community, uh, concerns righteous and fair and just living and doing what is right. And for the prophets, uh, they were concerned with those around them. The poor, the widows, the aliens, those who had been dis disenfranchised. So, what I want you to do this term is while all this other sensational stuff about prophecy that grabs people's eyes as they check out of the supermarkets, um, I want you to judge on your own what the prophets have to say. Not deductively, where somebody tells you these people are predicting these events in America today or the Middle East today. I'm not saying the Bible has nothing to say about the modern world or even the Middle East today. But what I am saying is because <coughs> prophecy has been so abused by people, the very credibility of the Bible by those outside the family of faith has suffered because they say, well, if you were wrong in predicting this Antichrist, or I have a friend who's a national radio broadcaster, and he likes to say occasionally in these his senior years, after they buried my fifth candidate for Antichrist, I decided I better change my drumbeat. And when he was a young man, he was saying, this person, this tyrant, this person who's on the political landscape is obviously the candidate to be the Antichrist. Well, you can only bury so many. If you expect people to believe the gospel when you present it because you say it's true, then they're going to say, well, pastor, you were wrong in this. That guy wasn't the Antichrist. And you were wrong in that. You said it was going to be Rosh Hashanah 1988, and it wasn't. Now how do you expect me to believe the truth of the Word of God? So we have to be very careful. There should be a lot more from the pulpits of America, and particularly the televangelists and others, who are setting these things out there to influence people. There should be a lot more of it could be, it might, there is a possibility, it may. But those kinds of words I find often are lacking. One thing the scripture does not want us to do is to be so focused on the future that we fail to redeem the present and do what God wants us to do. This reminds us of a very important problem found in the New Testament. One of our little books in the New Testament is called Second Thessalonians. And 2 Thessalonians had to deal with a problem. One of the major problems was, 1 Thessalonians was probably one of the first epistles written in the New Testament. And you often hear sections of it at funerals, don't you? Because it deals with the sure 
hope of a second coming. And that's, Paul wanted to make that very clear to this Greek audience that did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. Greeks believed in the immortality of the soul. And so, so Paul, <coughs> writing to a Greek audience, wanted to make that crystal clear. The Lord will descend from heaven, etc. Uh, there will be a second coming. But because people were so enamored with that, Paul had to address them with a second letter. And the second letter says people were sitting back and they weren't working. Indolence. Because they were so focused on it could be any moment, why bother to work? And they were eating other people's food. Somebody who's eating your lunch, quite literally. <laughs> and Paul says, if anyone should not work, neither should they eat. So, basically, Paul admonishes them in part of his second epistle to the Thess Thessalonians. Don't sit back with your eyes glued to the heavens. Get to work um, because no room for being so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. So Paul brought a corrective to that early church in the mid-first century. And I think we need to consider that because we go through these cycles uh, in the church. Um, the left behind cycles where everybody's talking. When I first came to Gordon College, by the way, in uh, 1971, I went to a local church to visit and the whole church was out, seemed engaged before the service began. Have you read the late great planet Earth? by Hal Lindsey. And that little book sold millions and millions and millions of copies, and I think it was the best-selling religious book of the 1970s when all the dust settled. And that had very much uh, an end-time focus to it. Um, Today, there are a lot of people who say, who's Hal Lindsey? What's the late great planet Earth? <laughs> I think I'm still living on it. <laughs> but we go through these, these cycles uh, in the church. Um, I was invited to uh, speak uh, once at one of these end time uh, communities that was, established, was originally established in northern Minnesota where people uh, stored food, went out into the wilderness to prepare themselves for the end. I came there about <coughs> 20 years later because some of the people had got tired of waiting <laughs> for the end and had left and uh, there was just some hardy people left, I'm trying to rebuild it with a more balanced view of Christian community than the original reason why people had come. Um, so in your generation, you will see this. Uh, history tends to repeat itself in this particular area. Um, what I would like to suggest is let the prophets speak for themselves. Um, don't bring with you this idea of prophecy being equated with the future. Etymologically, in English, our word prophet comes from two Greek roots, pro and a verb, phemi. 
Femi means to speak, and pro is in the word pronoun, means in, in place of or instead of. A pronoun is instead of or in place of a noun. So, etymologically speaking at least, the word prophet simply means that someone who speaks for someone else it gives a message, a spokesperson for someone else. That's properly what's behind the idea of prophet. Now we've loaded it, however, with a very futuristic kind of connotation. And uh, prophets were there to warn people about shoddy treatment of other people. Prophets were there to become heralds of moral righteousness, correcting abuse of the poor, abuse of slaves, speaking out against land monopoly, drunkenness, liars, oppressors of widows. People who padded their own homes, as Amos spoke out, building them even, decorating them with beautiful ivories, while the poor were neglected. This is really to hear the heartbeat of the prophets. Uh, they were the reformers of their day ethically, morally, spiritually, and in terms of social justice. Now, in the midst of that, God did also give them hope. Look at the black spirituals. Many of them were originally written in the midst of slavery, in the midst of very dour and difficult times. But yet, those songs which inspire us today when we hear them speak of hope. They speak of a future. They speak of a new world coming. Uh, of, of confidence in God even in the midst of present difficulties and disasters and burdens that they were facing. So the prophets very much are concerned about the present. And sometimes they talked about the near future. Let's take our friend Jeremiah. He's the most autobiographical of all the prophets. Prophesied the last 40 years of the southern kingdom. He warned people, if you don't get rid of your idols, because he said, as many as your cities, O Judah, are your idols, uh, 586 is coming. Babylon is on the horizon. Nineveh is about to fall, and Nineveh did fall in 612. And Babylon is anxious to come and take you away. And in fact, those words prove true. Um, and so Jeremiah spoke about a destroyed city of Jerusalem and a destroyed temple where the people were trusting the temple. They didn't think it was going to fall. In fact, they had According to the book of Jeremiah, this little thing they kept reciting, this is the temple, the temple, the temple of the Lord. And they recited that. I mean, we got the best God out there. He's not going to allow his house, his palace to suffer violence. And Jeremiah had to warn them of complacency. But God raised up another prophet to minister to the exiles for those 70 years in Babylon from 586 to 516. And that, of course, was Ezekiel who operated there 
among the prophets. But even there, as Ezekiel ministered to the prophets, he also gave words of hope. He talks of a renewal. He talks of a restoration. We've all heard of Ezekiel 37, the valley of dry bones that would come to life. God was not going to desert them in the graveyard of Babylon, but Israel would be restored and they would come to life and it would be more than physical life. God would put a new heart within them, take away the heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Now, I don't believe all the meaning and depth of that prophecy of Ezekiel has yet been experienced. But Ezekiel spoke of hope. Even in his last chapters of his book, while there's enormous divergence of how we interpret those last nine chapters of Ezekiel, he does speak of a regathering to the land, of a new temple, of a new uh, form of worship where God himself is present in new and dramatic ways among his people. And so, there are only two words that end the book of Ezekiel. yod heh vav heh shema The Lord is there. The Lord is present among his people. So the prophets spanked, they judged, they were critical of their generation, but they gave encouragement and hope. Do you consider Jesus a prophet? Start with what you do know. Yeah? Jesus is described as king, as priest, as prophet. Looking at him at as, as a prophet, one of our Jewish scholars, the president of Hebrew College, came to campus and spoke a couple years ago. And he said, what is there about Jesus that reminds you of the prophets of Israel? He's a Jewish scholar coming to Gordon College and asking students, what was there about it? Well, Jesus called people to repentance. So do the prophets of Israel. Uh, Jesus was concerned about ethical undoing and moral undoing. Um, and he spoke out against things that he was disappointed to see in the temple. As people were focused more on commercial things than on spiritual things. And so he might overturn a table with the money changers because he wanted to turn people's hearts right. This is what the prophets did. They rebuked and their words stung. They corrected. They proclaimed. Who is a prophet? A prophet is a spokesman spokesperson for God. Sometimes God spanked and sometimes God gave hope and encouraged about the future. As the Talmud says, if you have to spank a child with the left hand, you must always draw them nearer with the right. And that word which uh, the rabbis came up with a number of centuries following Jesus is really what you see in the prophets. Um, some parts of prophetic literature are oracles of judgment. But then God comes back and he quickly embraces his people, says, I will forgive you, I give you hope, I promise you a Messiah, etc., etc., Do you have any questions or anything I've said so far? Let me place <clears throat> the prophets. Um, 
I don't know what why this thing is off today, but okay. Let me uh, use. Oh, well, that's not going to do. I'll, I'll go back to my old chalk. Since electronics don't work, um, remember we used the word uh, Tanakh for the Bible that we're studying in this course. That's an acronym. The T stands for the Torah. Five books of Moses, what we call the Pentateuch. In this course, we're interested in the N, which is the Nevi'im. The Nevi'im are the prophets. The last, K, stands for the Ketuvim, or the writings. And of course, there's a slightly different order of books in the Hebrew Bible. So we're right here in the smack center of the threefold division of the Hebrew Bible. Anyone know where that threefold division is hinted at in the New Testament? Luke 24, 1 Peter 2, which speaks of what is written in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. The Psalms, <coughs> the first book in the Ketuvim, or the Writings. So, Nevi'im, translated into English, is the Prophets. And the Prophets are of two different sections. Under the prophets, the Nevi'im, you have the former prophets. Now if you ask average Larry Lehman, that I referred to before, give me the books <coughs> of the former prophets Probably wouldn't think this way, but Joshua, Judges, First and Second Samuel, and First and Second Kings. These are what comprise the former prophets. Now, we don't normally think of those books as prophets, but they are found <clears throat> in the prophetic literature of the Hebrew Bible. And while, according to Jewish tradition, those books were authored by people who were prophets, they rather provide for us the historical background against which we understand part B, which are the, the latter prophets. If you want to know what was going on in Jerusalem during Isaiah's day, you can get some pretty good historical background from kings that will tell you about Uzziah. The time of his death, Isaiah begins his ministry, and Hezekiah, and so forth. But the latter prophets consisted of... of Four books. There were four here in the former. Joshua, Judges, First and Second Samuel were viewed originally as one book, and First and Second Kings as one book. <clears throat> so, in closing today, 
you have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then what are called <coughs> the Twelve. <coughs> Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, <coughs> and the Twelve. When you take all the material found in the 12 minor prophets, it's approximately the size of the longest prophet. Now, Isaiah has the most chapters, but actually Isaiah is not the longest prophet. Isaiah, Jeremiah, in terms of pages of text, is, is the longest. But if you took all of the minor prophets and put them together. So the Jewish community refers to these as the twelve. And so our focus in this course is going to be on the latter prophets. Um, talking primarily about Isaiah and the twelve. But I will be working in material from other parts of that as we go along. All right, I think our time is up, so we'll, we'll end there today, and we'll pick up with some more introductory material on Wednesday. This is Dr. Marv Wilson in a course on the Biblical Prophets. This is session number one, Introduction. Introduction.